Okay, so welcome back. Uh, today we're just going to answer, we're going to go into a little bit more depth, right? The textbook talks about uh, basically extrapolating data from a graph. Uh, so basically we're going to have to uh, uh, learn how to do that. So I'm, I'm going to basically take one of the questions from the textbook, I'm going to modify it, and I'm going to walk you through each step and why, why each step is, is critical. So basically the, the question states that uh, we're going to be doing a, an oxidation redox couple. Uh, so we've got zinc, and we're going to mix it with a solution of copper sulfate. And what's going to occur here, right? This is just a, a standard oxidation redox reaction. Uh, it's it's basically it's spontaneous. It happens without needing to add any additional heat. And that's basically just from looking at the table of reactivity. Is we're going to see that copper is much lower on the table of reactivity than zinc. Therefore, zinc will displace copper from the sulfate and become uh, zinc sulfate instead. So we've got uh, forms copper solid and zinc sulfate. Uh, so basically, what, what we're going to check here, right? We're doing a, we're, we're going to try to calculate uh, the energy of this reaction, like how how much heat is released, and then we can compare that to how much zinc we added, and then we could figure out the, the specific heat capacity, or we can figure out another specific heat capacity. We can figure out the uh, the heat that's released when we dissolve one mole of zinc into into different amounts of copper sulfate. So basically, what we're going to have is we're going to have a, uh, uh, what the question gives you is that you've got 28.8 grams of copper sulfate solution. So right now we're not uh, we're not necessarily going to look at this because this can be one of the errors of the experiment that we're going to talk about. The question just states that you have 28.8 grams of copper sulfate solution, uh, and the mass of zinc that you have, mass of zinc that we have, is 1.37 grams. 1.37 grams. So you, you take this 1.37 grams of zinc. We take a calorimeter, which is basically just a double insulated styrofoam cup uh, with a lid on it and then a thermometer jammed inside of it. So basically what we're going to see is we're going to see, you know, once we dissolve the zinc, is the temperature of the solution inside going to increase? Is it going to decrease? Is it going to stay the same? Meaning that no reaction has occurred, an endothermic reaction has occurred, or an exothermic reaction has occurred. So the, the question gives you this and the question gives you a graph. And the graph I'm going to try to draw basically is as well as I can. So the graph, uh, I'm going to put some numbers to it. So I'm going to say this is 1 degree Celsius. Up here I'm going to say is 40 degrees Celsius and in between. So halfway right here is 20. Halfway right there is 10. Halfway right here is about 30. And we've got time. So time in minutes. Uh, so let's do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven. We'll just do eleven minutes. That's that's, a, that's enough time. So basically, the graph that it gives you uh, just shows you, you know, a few data points. It says, okay, uh, at at one minute, you're one degree Celsius. At two minutes, you're one degree Celsius. At three minutes, you're one degree Celsius. Four minutes, you're one degree Celsius. At five minutes. You're, you're 30 degrees Celsius. At six minutes, you're, you're a little bit higher. Uh, at seven minutes, uh, it starts to go down. So eight minutes starts to go down. Nine minutes starts to go down. Ten minutes starts to go down. Eleven minutes, so it starts to go down. So we can see some sort of uh, heat loss. But basically, uh, sorry, this graph might be drawn a little bit off for what I want to do, but we can we can modify it afterwards to kind of, you know, fit our data just because I drew this by hand. Uh, so what we're going to see, right, we see that the temperature of the solution maintains and then skyrockets, curves off, and then starts to drop down. So what we see here, right, it's... Uh, you know, in, in thermochemistry and in uh, calorimeters, one of the be one of the things that we assume is we assume a limited uh, heat loss. So we assume 
heat loss. But the thing is that that's hard to assume in real life situations, right? If you took this graph right here in real life, this is the graph you could potentially form in real life. You know, the graph that, you know, an ex ideal experiment would have was we have a set temperature, we'd have a spike and the temperature, you know, we wouldn't have any temperature loss. We just, we, we, we'd be able to maintain that temperature, but we don't have the proper apparatus in order to, to insulate this absolutely perfectly so that we've got no temperature loss. So we get temperature loss in real life situations. And, and here too, we see a temperature loss. So I'm gonna show you what to do with your data when you find out that you've had that temperature loss. Um, so basically what, what you're gonna do is, is if you got a graph like this, right? We we assume limited, limited or or no, limited or no heat loss at all. So the way to figure out what the end, the the heat changes here or the real temperature changes here, is as soon as you get a a, a discontinuing trend over here. So so here, right? We see, we see a trend. It, it, it's decreasing at a set amount per second. So what you do is you basically just uh, run a line of best, best fit through this data. So you just take it, and you basically extrapolate the data from the curve. As we draw a set curve all the way down to the bottom, and you continue it to the left. And then you calculate what would have been the highest change versus the lowest change down here. And that is, is your actual change in temperature, assuming that you didn't lose anything to, to the environment. You know, we, we see it. We see it from the graph that we are losing something to the environment. The temperature is decreasing. Uh, so that heat needs to go somewhere. That heat's going to everything outside of our system. So it's a heat loss. Uh, so basically, you just continue your line of best fit and, and find what, what the temperature change would have been if there was no heat loss. Because right, if this reaction proceeds right here, it's one second, so we can see in one second we have a heat loss. We have a heat loss right here. So even if the reaction happens over a minute, we could still have a, a, a heat loss over the next minute. We can have a more heat loss. So where this data starts isn't where the actual uh, uh, temperature change starts. So then once you've basically extrapolated this point, then you can, you can start to uh, do your calculations. So you do delta T is equal to temperature final minus temperature initial. So delta T is equal to 40 minus one is equal to 39 uh, is degree Celsius. Or, you know, uh, as soon as we, as long as we're doing temperature change, we can also write this as Kelvin, just because, right, uh, Kelvin, Kelvin is degree Celsius plus 273.15. Uh, so basically, right, if you just take a large number, you take, uh, you know, 40 degrees, 40 degrees Celsius would end up just being 273.15 plus 40. So basically, if we take the difference between the final, we're just going to minus 273 off of it anyways, right? We do any Kelvin, we take off 273. We take it minus another Kelvin, it's 273. So as long as our units are the same, Celsius minus Celsius, the delta T will give us a change in Celsius or a change in Kelvin, just because it's a set, it is a set number. Uh, so basically now we've got our change in temperature. So we use that same formula. You do Q equals MC delta T, the heat, Q is equal to the mass, which is the mass of what we're measuring the temperature change of, which we're measuring the temperature change of the solution. So in this case, 28.8 uh, grams uh, C. Uh, this is one of our assumptions, and this is an assumption you typically have to make a lot in IB, so just remember it. Uh, you basically assume that a solution has the same uh, heat capacity as uh, water. So you assume it has the same heat. Oh man, that is written bad. Heat capacity. So it has the same heat capacity as, as that of water, which is what we kind of introduced in the last video. If you forget that, uh, we can go uh, heat capacity of water. So 4.186 joules per gram.
joules per gram Kelvin. So, so 4.18, we're going to round it to. So we've got 4.18 joules per gram per Kelvin. And we multiply that by the change in temperature, which is 39 Kelvin. So Q is equal to, let me get my calculator out here, Q is equal to 28.8 grams multiplied by the heat capacity of water multiplied by 39. So our, our, our final answer is 4,694 4,694.976976 joules which if we want to convert that to kilojoules Q is equal to 4.69 kilojoules. I'm just going to do that just for a, for a simplification. So Q equals 4.69 kilojoules. That's how much energy uh, this reaction released the system in order to cause 28.8 grams of copper sulfate to, to raise temperature by 39, uh, 39 Kelvin. So then we have the final final part of the question is in the part two of the question. Let me just erase this graph. So you already know how to extrapolate the data now, how to draw your line of best fit once you see a, uh, a continuous trend in the curve. Uh, so now it's going to say, uh, calculate the molar molar enthalpy change. So right, molar enthalpy, what that means is delta H, our units are in kilojoules per mole. So we have to figure out, now we, we, we know how many kilojoules we have, so we can do the first part of the calculation. Delta H is equal to 4.69 kilojoules. But then we have to calculate how many moles of zinc. What is the molar enthalpy change? of adding zinc, the zinc to this copper, this specific copper sulfate solution. So what we have to do is we have to take our, our mass of zinc, which is 1.37 grams, and convert that to moles. So you convert that to moles by dividing it by the molar mass of zinc, which is, uh, oh, sorry, I had it right here. Uh, molar mass 65.38. So 1.37. 37 divided by 65.38 equals, let's see how many moles we equal. So 1.37 divided by 65.38 is 0.021 moles. 0.021 moles. And we just divide the kilojoules by the moles to figure out the molar enthalpy change uh, of this reaction. So we divide that by 0 0.021 moles, and our delta H value becomes 4.69, 4 divided by 0 0.021, and we've got 233, uh, 223, 223 kilojoules per mole. And then we checked from the graph, right? The temperature increased, so it's an, uh, an exothermic reaction, so it's negative. So, so that's basically how we solve these questions: is you take what what solution, you know, what solution, uh, what what you're using to measure the temperature change. Uh, so your first step. Sorry, I'm just going to erase all of this over here. First step is basically, sorry, I'm going to change the color too. First step, determine what you're measuring the temperature change of, and therefore C. So C was your specific heat capacity. So every time you see a solution, you assume that the specific heat capacity is that of H2O, unless it is given. So unless it is given. If they give it to you, of course, you need to use the C number that they give you. Uh, number two, you calculate Q based off of Q equals MC delta T. And then three, you take what you dissolved or what you're reacting 
So gram of reactant, you convert that to moles. And step four, you basically, you take Q, divide it by the moles, and that gives us our delta H. So it gives us our delta H value in kilojoules per mole. And that's, that's the value that we want, kilojoules per mole or joules per mole. And the question will tell you basically which unit it wants them in, but typically kilojoules per mole. Okay, I hope this helped. Uh, practice those questions in your textbook. Try to practice as many Q equals MC delta T questions as you can. Double check the answers. Alrighty, good luck.